Hi everybody, it's 12 o'clock. I hope everybody's comfortable. Uh, thank you so much for attending today's webinar on the best management practices for Japanese knotweed. It's the eighth a series of eight webinars based on these management protocol booklet series. And my name is Amanda Warren, not Kelly Sherman. I outreach live on and on behalf of Kelly and Colin here at the OIPC office, I am very pleased delivering this webinar to you today. So, very logistics before we get started. Those with headsets, you should be all set. For those of you who would like to switch to telephone for audio, the total number is in the chat box. And the access code to the event is 663-471-580. You can also find that on our website, website of WebEx, that is. The phone will be on mute during the presentation and answer period, so please type any questions you have in our question and answer box, not the chat box. And uh, our panelists will answer them at the end of the presentation. And I introduce our panelists for today, Phil Whitten. Hi, Phil, are you there? Sorry, I'm mute. Yes, I am here. There you go. Freya is uh, from the Credit Valley Conservation Authority, and she received her master's in environmental protection and management at the University of Edinburgh. Edinburgh, Scotland, that is, right, Freya? Yep. Yes. Wonderful. Welcome. Um, you worked on a variety of projects, including Arctic vegetation communities and greenhouse gas emissions in the lower uh, the Hudson Bay lowlands and ecological land classification in southern Ontario, and you work with the uh, Japanese knotweed at present as well, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. The presentation will be approximately 30 to 40 minutes, and uh, we'll use the rest of the hour for questions and discussion. And I would also like to mention that each of these webinars is recorded and will be posted on our website. So those are that uh, would like to look back on it and uh, listen to it again or just see the slide presentation again and read the details that will be available on our website. I'm taking a look very quickly at our chat box and make sure that everybody's doing well. I don't see any concerns, so we'll just keep going. Best management practice webinars were developed to provide land managers with the proper tools for accurately identifying and actively controlling invasive plants. And we've had, as I mentioned, eight of these seminars coming this one today. But we also want to make everybody aware of a new addition to the webinar series this, this year. Commitment um, in the urban green space. Stewardship successes and struggles in invasive species management will be uh, presented on May 4th, 2016 uh, by Karish Nandran, if I'm pronouncing his name right. Wood Conservancy. So please keep that in mind for May 4th. Uh, I believe that's three weeks' time. Anyways, these training modules have been funded by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and they are designed to support the actions of the Ontario Invasive Species Strategic Plan. A little bit about us. If you don't know by now, OIPC, we were formed in 2007 to provide a coordinated provincial response to the growing threat of invasive plants. Uh, we have a membership that is very large and growing, and it uh, involves every government to private industry, academia to First Nations, uh, and anybody who's interested in becoming a member or a particular, in particular, joining a committee. Um, these committees are the ones that really do the work, uh, provide the expertise that then go into our webinars and our our um, uh, productions and our technical documents. Anybody interested in that, please contact the OIPC. Our information is on the last page, or you can go to our website. Just let know. Just the topic for today. Uh, and the goal of this webinar, again, is to provide the land managers with any tools they need to control Japanese knotweed. And we're going to go very quickly through background, distribution, identification, a few lookalikes, and habitat and impacts of the plant. And then we're going to spend the majority, hopefully, of the time on the best managed practices. Japanese knotweed. Uh, 
all Mexican bamboo, although it is actually not a bamboo at all. It's known as leaf flower, Japanese polygonum, or hutsang. It's the names of polygonum, cuspidatum, and previously uh, had a, a second name. Uh, we refer to that as official webinar as polygonum cuspidatum. Uh, in Japan, which is the home of the killer plant, is not weed. It's referred to as Isidori, which is a strong plant, and that's a very appropriate name for this plant as it is invasive and it's, it's very hard to get rid of. It's a perennial, it's herbaceous, it's in the buckwheat family, and it's, uh, as I said, it's native to uh, Eastern Asia, but it's not very common there. Um, one of the first species to grow after eruptions is Japanese knotweed or any kind of disturbance. It really favors disturbed soils uh, and disturbed places, such as, as for instance, the volcanic slope, of which many in Canada. Um, just kidding. Introduced to North America as a horticultural plant in the late 19th century, it was widely planted. Uh, it's an ornamental. It's pretty. Uh, it's, uh, it was also planted for erosion control. It was planted for forage for livestock. It was uh, also planted for medicinal purposes um, and also for bioremediation. But now, regarded as one of the top 100 worst invasive plants globally, and that was designated by the Global Invasive Species Database. Recorded in Ontario, like I said, in the early 1900s, 1901, in Niagara Falls. And it's now found throughout southern Ontario and as far as White River and Thunder Bay. The uh, majority of the sites have been reported in the last 10 to 20 years. And it's found primarily in Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic provinces with isolated populations in Winnipeg and Manitoba and British Columbia. Um, it is tolerant of persistent freezing conditions, and as a result, it, it may spread to confine. Uh, it may spread north. It may be confined to the more southerly parts of, of Canada. However, with warmer climates, the climate change, it may uh, spread further north. Internationally, it's widespread in the northeastern United States, and it's also considered an invasive species in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. And it's in huge in the UK where uh, in 2010 was knowledge that uh, it could not be found, um, sorry, it, you couldn't go six square miles without finding Japanese knotweed and it's gotten worse since 2010 I'm sure. We're going to a little bit over Japanese knotweed, how to identify it. Uh, please keep in mind uh, that you can reread any of these details on our website, so I'm going to go through them quickly. They are a little bit wordy, but that was done on purpose so that people could look back and uh, and, and review these documents later. These are hollow, they're smooth, and they're jointed stems. Um, they look very much like bamboo, but they are not mentioned a bamboo. Um, stems can be up to 2.5 centimeters in diameter. Uh, they're purple green, but they fade green as they mature. Addish brown no nodes, which you can see on the left hand side and on the right hand side, uh, surrounded by this papery sheet, which is called a cytule. Stems die back each fall. Stocks do remain standing over winter. Um, Stems emerge in the spring, which is about in Ontario late March to early April, and it does resemble asparagus, and it does get mixed up with asparagus quite a bit. Um, and it begins as a reddish purple plant. It can go eight to eight centimeters a day in ideal conditions. Um, it's about up to a meter height in just three weeks, with the plant reaching full size by the end of July. Very quickly growing, very, very quickly growing. It also grows in large bamboo-like clumps. Oval, as you can see, um, slightly triangular with a pointed tip, flat at the base, long petiole. And they grow alternately on, on the stem in a zigzag pattern. You can see that on the on the right. 
uh, the distinct zigzag pattern. 10 to 17 centimeters long, 7 to 10 centimeters wide. Our green. The small white green, and they long sprays uh, in sprays along the stem. Come from approximately in Canada, sorry, in Ontario, July to October. They produce uh, they're produced in branching panicles or clusters. And these panicles, these clusters, are usually longer than their closest leaves, which is a key ID feature when pairing it uh, to their uh, a look. The, the seeds, which are formed soon after flowering, uh, are winged and small, triangular, shiny, and very small. And this wind and water dispersal. Japanese knotweed, as a side note, is dioecious, uh, which means the male and the female flowers are for plants and they, they require pollination to produce any kind of viable seed. Um, in Ontario, we only have a male, male sterile clone, which means it doesn't produce or it shouldn't produce anything. Uh, so when pollination does occur, we know there's much research into it if the seeds in Ontario that are produced are viable. Um, so this is primarily a plant that reproduces uh, by rhizomes. And it does so extremely effectively and quickly. As a side, unviable seeds are produced. Uh, they can be pollinated by related invasive species such as giant knotweed, uh, which is also in Ontario, and bohemian knotweed, which is possibly in Ontario at the moment. So these may be uh, viable and uh, be a source of, of spread as well. Which are quickly developing uh, underground. They quickly develop large underground root systems, which make up about two thirds, on average, of the plant mass, the total plant mass. Uh, then, uh, three meters deep into the ground and 14 to 18 meters from the parent plant, uh, and outwards at 50 centimeters a year in, in optimal conditions. And this is huge. This is quick. It's fast, and they don't need necessarily light to do so. A one centimeter piece of stem or rhizome can produce new plants within six days if submerged in water. And uh, the rhizomes can survive temperatures then to the minuses, uh, minus 35 degrees Celsius, minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and they can uh, go into uh, a stasis, a homeostasis, a, a hibernation, if you will, for up to 20 years until optimal growing conditions uh, are uh, around, or if perhaps if they're dug up from a, a, a deep uh, and brought to the surface. After 20 years, they can still be, in some cases, viable. As I mentioned, pieces of the stem or rhizome can produce new plants, and you can see this in the photograph. Uh, above. So now, giant knotweed, uh, which is also invasive in Ontario, it's native to northern Japan as well. Uh, it's found in the southern Ontario, uh, mostly southeastern region, which is uh, Leeds County, Ottawa, and also the uh, Niagara region. It was introduced in Ontario as an ornamental, and it does very big, bigger than a Japanese knotweed, about double the size, uh, two to four centimeters in height. All the bigger, badder sibling of Japanese knotweed, if you will. It also has hollow stems. They're light green. And all remain standing when dead, which is the same as Japanese knotweed. The shaped or elephant ear leaves have long hairs, long, very thin hairs on the underside. And uh, the leaves grow bigger, 50 40 centimeters long, about 10 to 28 centimeters wide. They're all greenish white flowers, in, in, in which grow also in these clusters. 
Um, but they're shorter than the nearest leaves. Flowers bloom from about July to September in Ontario, and their fruit is also winged. It's also shiny, it's also small, and it's black. King of knotweed is another lookalike of the species of Japanese and giant knotweeds. Uh, it was first reported in Georgetown in a garden in Georgetown in Ontario, and it's suspected of being more invasive, more aggressive than the parent plants. Uh, so they take on the superior qualities of both, and this can uh, make it even more difficult to control. Are reddish brown and hollow, and they are the two species do remain standing throughout the winter. They grow to about two to three cent uh, meters in height. Alternate flowers, uh, sorry, leaves shaped to heart shaped, have these long tapered leaf tips. They have short, broad hairs on the underside of the key of the leaf, which is a key ID feature of this plant. Those grow about 20 centimeters long, 20 centimeters wide. And they're greenish white. They grow in clusters on mid sized stalks. And they bloom from about July to September. The fruit is also winged, shiny, small black. Weed is into the Himalayan. Himalayan region of South Asia, as the name would suggest. Um, at the moment, there's no known populations in Ontario, but it is invasive in and found in British Columbia, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. Stems, uh, it has red stems and uh, leaf stalks, but they also remain standing when dead, which is the same as all the other species we've just discussed. Grow approximately two meters in height, has long alternate thin leaves up to 20 centimeters long, so it, the leaves look a little bit different, and 10 centimeters wide. Um, similar to Himalayan balsam, with a plant that may be confused with this, um, but it doesn't have the serrated edges, the serrated leaves of the Himalayan balsam. The fruit to white, they grow in clusters and they bloom approximately in July to September. On to the habitat and impact. So I'm going to just take a look very quickly in our box and question and answer box to make sure there's nobody having problems. Only in the chat box. Let's see. Having uh, you've solved your problems. If not, if you're having any problems with it, please call that one eight five five number that's in the chat box. So on to habitat. Just not wheat grows in a variety of site conditions. It grows mostly in the sun. It can also grow in deep shade. It prefers these moist soils in riparian areas, uh, in wetlands, but it can also grow from a little bit of moisture, such as the moisture from a roof but when it rains and it has runoff. A little moisture goes a long way with this plant. It goes in disturbed areas. It typically takes advantage of these areas that are disturbed by humans. And it can grow in, in heavily polluted areas of Japan, in soils contaminated, with heavy metals, uh, it's tolerant. It grows in, in places where it's recently disturbed, roadsides, rail beds, old homesteads, forest edges, fields, etc. And before it can survive extreme climates, uh, it can survive contaminated soils. Um, <clears throat> it has escaped from gardens, uh, it does so readily. It also spreads uh, landfill. Or if you have loam trucked in, for instance, uh, if you're in a building site, uh, contractors bringing in soil, if you have compost from another area and you bring it into your garden, all it takes is that one 
root fragment about the size of your fingernail, uh, and it will start regrowing. Huge locations uh, for biodiversity. It can severely degrade the quality of wetlands and riparian habitats. Um, it grows densely. The thickets, which you can see on the right-hand upper picture, are very dense. They don't allow light penetration. The light penetration can re be reduced by more than 90%. Uh, the native species then that, that are growing normally as ground cover can be completely eliminated. Uh, a study by Cornell University found that knotweed can reduce native species ground cover within a Japanese knotweed stand to zero. So, questions on biodiversity. Uh, the result of this is that the reduced native bi plant di biodiversity uh, also results in lowered in invert densities um, and the established knotweed stands don't support the same number of native amphibians, reptiles, birds, uh, mammal populations that a diverse community would. Also, uh, previously thought to have had allelopathic uh, properties, uh, it uh, has been confirmed that that we does have allelopathic uh, properties, which means uh, that it, it is um, chemicals that inhibits the growth of other plants around it. It, it essentially poisons the soil for other plants to grow. Uh, the leachates. Um, uh, this species, for instance, in a study by Dumangit, D M M A N G E T, at all in 2014, uh, we're looking at the leachates from Japanese knotweed grown in the lab. Its growth is linked to emission of, of polyphenol compounds. Um, the leachates also induce changes in soil nitrogen composition. So on one hand, it does poison the cells for other things to grow, but it does change the normal composition or the native composition of the cell uh, in nitrogen compounds, nitrogen composition. The big thing that it can do is just grow out of control so it blocks everything else. For instance, for recreation, it can block and hinder access to water for recreational activities such as boating, angling, uh, or fishing, swimming, uh, hunting, and feeds traffic along hiking trails uh, uh, and, and biking trails. So it does affect recreation, but an even bigger and costlier uh, act is its impact on infrastructure. It can significantly impact and infrastructure. It can grow through concrete or asphalt that's up to eight centimeters thick. It can grow through uh, um, so it can grow uh, through any kind of soil. It can grow under roads, through roads. The weed root system uh, holds soil as well, so it's not good for a soil erosion. Use uh, and those soil banks can then become stable and prone to erosion and flooding. Uh, it is considered a controlled waste in the UK. Uh, it's prohibited in Michigan. You can't sell it, you can't purchase it, you can't transfer it, you can't mow it, etc. Um, the reason it's particular concern to new housing developments. Uh, the Japanese not in the UK, for instance, developers must dispose of the soil containing knotweed fragments at hazardous waste facilities. And if they don't, they could be defined up to £5,000 or be sent to prison for up to two years if you allow the contaminated soil or plant material from waste in your yard to transfer or to be spread into the, to the wild. So in the UK, it's a big problem, and there's no reason that that wouldn't become a big problem here in Ontario as well. A few pictures from a BBC special, BBC one that was aired in the UK. You can see this family had a brand new house 
built in a brand new subdivision and they had just bought the house and after a couple of years, a couple of months, uh, they started to see this happening. And when they tore up the floorboards, the entire foundation was grown through by Japanese knotweed. So you can see these things do not stop easily. Uh, they're not certainly not stopped by a little bit of foundation, a little bit of dirt, a little, little bit of concrete, or a little bit of We're going to get into now, for the remainder of our presentation, uh, Japanese knotweed best management practices. Um, and we're going to, I think, if anybody was here for our previous seminars, we really do like to uh, put this idea of using integrated pest management. And integrated pest management simply means that everything you can to prevent or reduce damage caused by either the past or any the all um, uh, procedures that you're going to use. By using all the available information, the ecological information, the biology of the plants, at the time of year that you control, time of year that it flowers, for instance, the time of year that it, uh, that it grows, the time of year that it perhaps uh, flowers and seeds, the location of the plants, the size of the infestation, um, and the skill level, of course, of, of the um, people uh, controlling the, uh, the site. You want to put all of those into an integrated plan and uh, use a variety of tools, use a variety of approaches all together um, so that when you do your control, you do it at the best time with the least amount of damage to non-target organisms. Um, with chance of eradicating or controlling the plant itself. It's going to involve some rehabilitation of the site, replanting of native plants, uh, perhaps rejuvenation of the soil itself, because I mentioned Japanese knotweed uh, dormancy, like I said, go dormant for 20 years. It offers a serious threat to some of these eradication treatment methods. And if Japanese knotweed is threatened too strongly, or circumstances just prevent it from growing, the plant will go into this dormancy. And effectively, this is just extending what it goes through during the winter, but it can do so for up to 20, uh, 20 years. So, weed. you're going to monitor first. Uh, you can begin scouting as soon as the spring uh, thaw occurs. Uh, spring growth will uh, will occur approximately in March to April, and as soon as these start pushing through, you can start identifying how big um, your area will be. Want to do base of plant is control control the plant before it becomes established. Kid, if you only have one or two plants, and through your monitoring, you really do. Uh, evaluate that you only have one or two plants. That's great because you can get those out and uh, prevent them from spreading. It's impact on biodiversity, on the economy, on society. And studies have shown that Japanese knotweed has this lag time of about 20 to 40 years after planting before it really begins to extensively spread out from these founding populations. So you have a good amount of time to monitor. Um, catch these things and essentially and quite literally nip them in the bud. So begin your scouting as early as possible. Understand your infestation size and identify the order in which you're going to control. For instance, you're one of the satellite populations first, the small populations outside of the main uh, infestation area. Nip, get those first, prevent them from further spread. Then you're going to concentrate on high priority areas are they're site dependent, they're person dependent. So depending on what you want to do, uh, what the goal of your control is, if it's to increase productivity of a woodlot, for instance, if it's to uh, protect um, threatened species, um, if it's trying to protect a favored natural area, a hiking trail, it depends. You want to concentrate on those high priority areas first and treat them first. Also, if you're along any kind of water body, you want to begin upstream to, instead of downstream working up, uh, you want to begin upstream to avoid that, that further spread. Anything you break off and any seeds that you disturb will 
and go into the water and, and be spread downstream. You can treat and raise, of course. Uh, you're going to need to do some restoration because, as I mentioned, invasive plants, not only Japanese knotweed, but a lot of invasive plants are invasive because they can grow where other plants are not. Uh, disturbed areas, for instance, uh, poor soil quality, um, poor light quality, etc. And those invasives are the ones that tend to colonize after experiments and the ones that are going to sweep in. So if you get rid of Japanese knotweed, you might get another invasive coming in instead. So you want to make sure that you do some restoration, whether this means replanting the cleared areas with a cover crop, uh, native trees or shrubs, to prevent uh, other invasives from invading, or if you want to mulch, for instance, or cover with leaves to prevent other invasive plants from germinating in that disturbed soil. That can be done as well. You can also consider uh, regenerating the soil with a different uh, type of soil, covering up that seed bed, for instance, um, and uh, a good layer of additional soil that you've brought in that is invasive free. Can be done as well. And then what you're going to want to do is, of course, repeat, repeat, repeat. Japanese knotweed stands require three, I'm going to say three as a minimum, but on average five to ten years of active control to achieve an eradic eradication. Consider this every year, get your neighbors involved, get the local, for instance, conservation areas involved, local uh, municipalities involved, groups, many hands make light work. Um, but also, if your neighbor has it on their property, or you'll have it on yours soon as well. So it doesn't make any sense to work separately. Uh, and to do it at the same time every year, um, and maybe make uh, a little bit of a to-do about it. You know, bring some pizza, get some drinks, and have everybody over. A disposal. I'll make sure that this, and we'll talk about this later on in a couple of slides. Be extremely careful. You don't want to plant this, uh, spread this plant. Um, just the tiniest, as I mentioned, a fingernail uh, length of the plant um, will regrow. So you want to make sure that you dispose of it properly. The control measures uh, fall under the category of manual or mechanical. Um, For in mowing and cutting, continue cutting, for instance, with a brush mower at least once per month. It'll eventually weaken the rhizome. You start cutting when it's full grown in June, for instance. Then, but this is best used in tandem with another control method, for instance, cutting and then using a chemical control. Cut, recutting, recutting, recutting. It's a very labor intensive. And of course, whenever you cut the, this this material, you have to dispose of it properly. Um, so I've mentioned that um, but obviously every year it will be reduced a little bit. For instance, there's been one case where this individual cut 10 times the first year, nine times the second year, eight times the third year, etc. So it does go down. The rhizome and the roots start to weaken, um, but it takes quite a long time. And as I mentioned, uh, when the rhizomes weaken and um, their nutrient source has been depleted, uh, they are um, they can go into this this stasis where they they just essentially uh, go into a, a sleep and remain there until the conditions uh, better themselves. So um, cutting will weaken, but it will not eradicate. Young plants, um, but you have to dig them out with all their rhizomes in its entirety. They can, uh, you can miss uh, them and miss the tiny bit of a rhizome, and the infestation will come back. Um, so, you have to make sure you get every piece, which means essentially sifting the soil after you cut. For long um, infestation, um, for instance, uh, contractors who are and developers building houses. You can excavate, but of course this means um, you take everything on the site off. 
that means eradicating all of the plants. So it's not ideal for most conditions. For large populations, you uh, need heavy machinery. And you have to create these deep, deep pits that are over five meters deep uh, to regrow. You can bury it, but it has to be very, 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 very deep. And you should have these pits lined with some kind of root barriers. You excavate all of the infested soil of the top two meters. You bury it into the, these, these very deep pits. But as I mentioned, the top two meters is still not good enough. Um, some uh, roots can go down to as much as three meters. So, um, But top two meters is fairly typical. We bury them in these tips, pits, and then on top of them, for instance. But it's very labor intensive, it's very expensive, and uh, the damage is extensive. And it can be used, but only as a last resort. Uh, you can't bury it, it has to be removed and brought to a designated soil treatment area and landfill, which is also uh, not cost efficient. Or mechanical method is tarping. Essentially, it just means um, you're going to cover the area, prevent light from to it, and try to cook, essentially, the soil and everything under the tarp. Again, this destroys not just the jet not weed, but everything underneath that tarp. Uh, you're going to want to cut the stems, remove any old canes that could pop up and, and disturb the tarp or, or um, cut it, uh, and then cover it with a dark-colored tarp. You can use any kind of heavy material. Like You can also use a rug carpet, old carpet, for instance, um, but you're going to want to cover it uh, loosely enough to allow some growth under the top of the tarps because knotweed will still, as I mentioned, it grows through concrete and asphalt. Um, so that it's a little bit flexible. You want to make sure that the, uh, the tarp is entirely over the infestation and even further. Uh, leave in place for about three growing seasons or more. Always monitor it for rips and tears. Uh, and then once you remove it, you're going to need to replant with native species. This has had some, uh, some mixed reviews. There's been some good success with it, some, some limited success. Uh, it's best to use it with another combination, a method, for instance, uh, herbicide. Again, remember that the old canes are woody. So when they're broken, they, they're kind of knife-like, um, the same as bamboo would be. So you need to clear away those old canes. Uh, you need to tarp further out from the actual infestation because the rhizomes will spread outwards towards light. Uh, you need also those weed barriers used by landscapers or, or the blue poly tarps. Uh, those are good options. Um, on your tarp so it doesn't blow away. And uh, you can also use tent pegs, for instance, but make sure it uh, receives adequate sun exposure so it does cook the soil underneath. And make sure you have enough overlap with the tarp. Um, of course, too, is that when killing everything under the soil or under the tarp, including the mycorrhizae fungi that are found in the soil, you're going to want to add those back in before you do any kind of uh, rehabilitation, for instance, um, planting. Method, which I would say is also a biological method, is grazing. Um, this stuff is edible, especially when it's young. It is edible, and it's edible by, for humans as well. It makes some delicious fruit wraps. The issues are eaten by livestock, horses, uh, goats, um, uh, sheep. This will, again, it will only eradicate. It won't eradicate. It'll just suppress growth um, kind of across the root. Uh, to nutrient supply, of course, it's emitted in time. The grazing has to be right at the beginning of the growing season because once those uh, of the stalks are woody, uh, they're not edible or desirable by any animals anymore. In the pipeline is biological control. Biological control is the use of a herd before predator, pathogen, or other natural enemy to reduce populations of invasive species and uh, this wonderful because really what invasive species why part of the reason why they're invasive is that they don't have any natural enemies they were brought over from their homeland which in this case 
cases, Japan or India, other natural predators or, or pathogens were not brought over. So ecological control aims to establish an ecological balance once again. And two strains of psyllids were evaluated control of invasive knotweeds, not just Japanese knotweed, uh, but bohemia and uh, um, giant knot, uh, knotweed as well. It was released in 2015 by the CFIA, um, but they're still working on things like with over winter, where is the best place to release it, how are we going to release it, uh, the number of psyllids that you need to release on any one site. All of the logistics are still in work. Uh, the good news is it's, it's approved for safety, um, but that news is it's not yet available. Um, we'll keep you updated with that, and when it does become available, we'll make sure that everybody knows. Uh, and that our next um, webinar and also our next update to our BMP. Also, a leaf spot fungus that has been approved for use in the UK, uh, but that uh, is still undergoing safety testing, so it's not been approved yet in Canada. Control is fun uh, in that it takes a lot of paperwork, a lot of reading, and a lot of research before you can use chemicals uh, effectively. What right now is excerpt from the uh, Pest Management Regulatory Agency, PAMRA, website, which is a branch of Health Canada responsible for registration of pesticides in Canada. And according to the pesticide label database uh, that you see here, there are pesticides uh, with which you can control Japanese knotweed. Um, the fun part of this website is that uh, you can't just put in Japanese knotweed and find all of the chemicals that have in the label for, for a particular use. So a few different search terms that you can put in. Japanese kaskatum, uh, Japanese knotweed, knotweed Japanese in brackets, polygonum cuspidatum, fleece flower is another one. When I did this the other day, we had 220 REN registrations for the word knotweed, 167 of which were approved for commercial use, 53 for domestic, and one for something that I couldn't understand why. 53, however, when in Japanese cuspidatum, 26 came up when you put Japanese knotweed. When you put in knotweed, like it's Japanese, 70 for polygonum, polygonum cuspidatum, and one for fleece flower. Um, zero if you put in fallopia or if you put in the other name. So a little bit tricky. When you go on the website, you can explore the site and make sure you find one of the uh, one of these or, or a combination of these pesticides uh, herbicides that are most appropriate for you. That aside, you make sure that all of the regulations, including the Ontario Pesticide Act and Ontario Regulation 6309, are followed. That is absolutely 100% your responsibility. You decide for established populations. It may be Combine it with another uh, control option. For instance, a mechanical control, cutting and then spraying, for instance. Repeat cutting and allowing the plant to grow to full height between cuttings will weaken the roots, so that's a lot easier and a lot more susceptible to any kind of systemic herbicide. Um, for instance, a glyphosate based pest. You can use foliar applications or wick. Uh, stem injections or a wiper application as well, but make sure that whatever you use, relabel, relabel, read the label, and make sure you do whatever they tell you on the label. Anything else is just not legal. In case stem injections, it is best to inject them, inject them late summer or early autumn when the canes are about half an inch or more in width. Do not weed plants that are herbaceous perennials, and since their leaves die back in winter, 
it are roots that the plants kind of live on. And at the end of the growing season, nutrients are transferred from the leaves uh, down through the cane in the rhizomes. And uh, this transfer, which continues up until the first killing frost, that's when you're presented with the opportunity to hit Japanese knotweed really where it hurts, which is the rhizomes. So you to inject the canes with a pesticide, with an herbicide, and that'll essentially go along for the into the rhizomes, following the same path as the nutrients. And it's the rhizomes, which essentially, in the end, you really need to, to strike if you want to be successful with Japanese knotweed removal. Some people suggest injecting between the first and the second nodes up from the bottom, and some people say the third and the fourth node. So there's a little bit of uh, discussion between that. I can't uh, add anything more to that than to say keep trying and let us know which ones work best for you. A spray, however, a foliar spray, obviously to happen when the leaves are out in, in spring when they're fully extended. So isolated population and new populations to spray in late May and follow it up with an application in early summer. Uh, retreatments may be uh, needed as well for that were missed uh, those re-sprouts that come later in the season. So the leaves come out and then you use a foliar spray. As far as disposal mechanisms go out, well, that's the biggest key is you want to make sure that this stuff doesn't regrow no matter where you put it. Never compost Japanese. It can easily re-sprout. Rigments, twice in length, uh, about 20 millimeters in length, have been tested. Um, and the test included incubating them in compost or soil with wet or dry moisture contents, a different temperature, over a range of times. And the result of this test uh, suggests that temperatures in excess of 50 degrees Celsius will kill rhizomes of this plant means about 50 degrees Celsius over a few days. In a soil with lower moisture content, we're killed at a lower temperature after five hours, uh, but with a higher moisture content, it seems to be harder to kill them. You need a higher temperature. So rule of thumb, 50 degrees Celsius or higher for a few days. If you're at a lower temperature, it can make them inactive which means uh, you won't kill them, you'll prevent it from, uh, from growing, but that's not a, obviously it, it's not a permanent state. It'll, they'll become inactive with temperatures of about 45 degrees Celsius. So make sure that you reach that 50 degrees Celsius. If you cannot, uh, then place these plants in plastic bags, seal the plastic bags, the black plastic garbage bags, and allow them to cook in the sun for at least a week before disposing of them. Um, and then it's to dispose of them in, in the garbage. Um, you can also bring them into a landfill after they've been uh, uh, cooked in the sun. You require other permits um, depending on what you want to do um, and with whom you're working. Permits and other requirements may be necessary for any control project and it's responsible ability to get those permits or to see if you need any. Um, all the laws need to be um, looked at including things like, like that, um, if you're working anywhere where there may be nesting birds and particularly nesting birds that are on the endangered species list. Um, you want to make sure you follow the acts that have anything to do with endangered or, or um, threatened species, um, pesticide acts, um, or pest, uh, any kind of uh, environmental act, um, especially within reach of water. You want to make sure that you follow those and obey all of the laws within them. Uh, herbicide storage, disposal of herbicide use and transfer of herbicide, they're all regulated. Um, there are exceptions under the Pesticide Act, which allow chemical control of invasive plants on your property. Um, and you may fall into 
some exceptions for class nine pesticides. Um, for instance, a natural resource or, or industry or agricultural exception. Uh, if you think that you might fall under these exception rules, uh, you can contact the MOE or the MNRF and ensure that your project does meet these requirements and or exceptions and uh, you can ask them for a level of opinion as well in case you need one. Um, pesticide application as a rule uh, this must be done by a licensed exterminator or you must hold the appropriate certificate yourself. I mentioned this a little bit before. Restoration is extremely important. Um, you can restore and monitor. Restore can happen during control. It can also happen after control. Mulching reduces light availability. On the right, you can see a little bit of mulching done. Um, light reduces uh, sorry, mulching reduces light availability after not weed control. So this allow the more shade tolerant native species to germinate. Or if you uh, plant a few species, you can allow that, uh, them to do um, to get a competitive edge. You can also seed with an annual cover crop or native plant species immediately after control. This will help to establish those native uh, species as well. After control includes replenishing, like I mentioned, the mycorrhizae in the soil. Um, that'll help you reduce the allelopathic effects and restore the soil chemistry and the soil conditions. But you can add some more fresh compost. You can you can mix in some more fresh uh, soil as well. But make sure that when planting, you put some invasive, uh, non-invasive plants to other invasives that are going to come in and, and uh, colonize that disturbed soil. Um, plants, larger potted plants will, will also give a competitive edge over any invasive seedlings that germinate after control, um, but seeding will do as well. And then you're going to want to make sure you monitor, monitor, monitor. Like this is a long process. Monitoring is key. And catch them when they're small, catch individual plants, and you'll have a better chance of uh, having a successful control program. Slide, how to prevent the spread. Remember, there are ways that you can report Japanese knotweed if you see it. Let us know. These, uh, this website and um, our hotline is key to really helping um, coordinate the efforts throughout Ontario. Make sure you monitor. Make you stay on the trails and don't spread Japanese knotweed or any other invasive of, uh, to a pristine environment when you're out hiking, for instance, or ATVing. Uh, inspect and clean all of your equipment. Don't move anything that could be possibly contaminated by um, Japanese knotweed or any other invasive um, uh, to a different part and spread. Uh, clean it first. Uh, try to avoid disturbing any kind of soil, which means you know ATVing in a pristine environment. Uh, Keep your ATVs on on the trail. Use native species when you're in your garden, and don't plant Japanese knotweed. You can, as I mentioned, help track the spread of Japanese knotweed. Um, this is a great website. Uh, it's also got a phone app. You need to create an account, but it is free. It's fast. It's easy. We map invasive species, and you can look at the distribution maps and find out what's in your area. People to thank. But we get to the phones now and answer all of your questions, and we're going to go do that. If you have any more information, please contact us at these places. And uh, thanks very much for being with us. Fred, how are you? I'm I wrote down a few notes. One I I start off with your comments. Oh. Um, the first, <laughs> the first section I was going to uh, discuss was tarping. Uh, when we've done tarping, we have had limited success with this, very limited success. Usually smaller patches that are newer infestation, um, it works better, but we still find that we had to use herbicide control throughout, um, getting the ones that sprout up through it and on the edges. Um, we actually tried a few different methods of tarping. We did the sort of standard big blue tarp that you can get from any Canadian tire or anything, and then we put mulch over top of it. Um, part of that was for aesthetic reasons in one of our accommodation areas. Um, it didn't seem to stop the knotweed, obviously, from from growing up throughout. 
Um, I don't hear anything, so I'm hoping that, that means people can still hear me. Hello? Back over. <laughs> We're listening. Okay, I just went blank, and I got, oh. Um, this other method we worked, which was fairly successful, was actually using a pool liner. Uh, we had a landowner who did that, and so it was IV very thick rubber pool liner, um, so it cost them quite a bit of money, but it was much more successful in uh, reducing the amount of horizons that we saw when we pulled that up after uh, three years. Um, I was actually surprised to still see quite a bit of rhizomes. They were completely white, um, but they were still there. And we actually sprayed the rhizomes before we put anything back down with the herbicide. Um, that had much better success. This was on a fairly large patch versus another patch where we used just a standard tarp um, that we've had basically no success. That patch we've actually now been uh, trying various herbicides. We started off with glyphosate. Um, we did a, a using we split the patch into three and we did glyphosate, um, garlon, and the chloroprop D. Um, and we found that that didn't really seem to make a difference. Uh, some of the most potent herbicides, you could say, um, to kill it too quickly, so you'd get the foliage would die back, but it wouldn't get into the rhizomes. Um, so then naturally switched over. Last year, we've tested out another product with our product, Mycone. Um, what you'd heard is apparently supposed to be better at uh, Japanese knotweed. Granted, it is a fairly expensive herbicide uh, relative to all the other ones that we use. Um, and and I were discussing before this, uh, Japanese knotweed is not currently on the label. However, we've done through talking with the MOE, um, is what we go through is if it says an other weedy species, then that's sort of the catch-all caveat that you can then use that herbicide um, on other species that might not be listed on the label. Um, but it depends on your organization and their comfort level with sort of going to the, reading the label that way. It also might depend on um, the MOE representative that you talk to. Uh, but that is what we have done in the past. With the milestone patch, we are waiting to see how it comes up this year. So I could uh, let people know in a few months once we sort of see what the regeneration is like. We're actually going out to check it uh, next week and the week after to see what's coming up in the patches. But uh, as of now, it was just last year was our first application, and we did two applications of it. So um, we're hoping to have better success with that because we've been using the glyphosate product for five years now and have still seen this one patch just continue to spread. Good information. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, I could talk on and on and on. <laughs> I know. No, it's crazy. We're going to get to a few questions. Uh, what it would be an acceptable root barrier? Do you have an answer? Like, are you talking about if you were to dig it up and get it in a pit? You know, yeah, uh, we mentioned too with tarping, you can you can yeah. you bury it. Is there something that you would recommend, or is that something that you would talk we to your have, nursery about? We've yeah, never done the burying it. Uh, we tend to use herbicides and just spray the plant, so we actually don't remove the knotweed from the site. Um, we don't want to have it spread to other locations. Um, we've never done any work with that. The fact that it grows through concrete, I would be leery of anything that would work. We did find the rubber um, pool liner did work in the fact that we didn't have any of what we spread up through the pool liner. Um, so I know if a very heavy rubber would do it, but that would be my only suggestion of things that I know, and I guess a pool liner would work too because it's quite flexible, so you could fill a hole in. Um, but we've never tried to bury it. We just uh, sit and leave it as is, and that way it's uh, not being transported. Great. Is there? A, we've got someone asking about the cut and basil spray method. Do you have any experience with that? What time of year uh, would be best to apply that? They've heard fall, but is that correct? Do you know anything about that? Um, we've done it in late summer. I haven't done it past. Uh, the end of August, early September. So I'm not sure how late in the season you can do that. Uh, I've also done where when you're doing a later foliar spray um, and it is uh, over your head and so not the best thing to be using a backpack spray on. 
I fit uh, just sort of as high up as I am sort of comfortable with the weed whacker or just used um, hedges and cut it so just above waist height. And I've sprayed the, the stems, sort of doing a basal stem spray on those, and that still worked. I've also, you know, people have um, done this with uh, Johnny's Wild Rose. I'll just pour herbicide into the stems, but to me that's kind of finicky because you're looking at a little hollow stem. Um, so that's my experience with that. We have done injection as well. I can jump into that if that's okay. Um, where uh, with the injections, if you do it on smaller stems, it will split them and then the herbicide just runs down the outside so it's not as effective. Um, or it splits it so much that it just shoots through the other side and you're not really um, <laughs> ingesting the plant. Uh, and the other thing is if you are doing a stem injection, which is actually quite fun if you get the little injector gun, um, sure, in the node that you're injecting <laughs> into, do it at the top, top to the bottom, because if you do it at the top, then the side will just come back out through your hole. Um, and spill. if you do it near the top, then it has that whole section of the node to fill in and sit in there. Thank you. We have a little bit of debate going on, uh, and, and this isn't the first time it's brought up, but it's the idea of cutting the plant um, being dangerous because of the fact that the plant reestablishes so easily by the littlest piece. Um, and how do you really know that you have an effective control program by just using a, con a mechanical control method? And I think my answer would be you, you really need. Uh, both types of control, uh, chemical and, um, for instance, and mechanical. And the other obvious reason, uh, way is to really fantastically clean up the area after you cut it. But do you have anything to add to that, um, the dangers of, of cutting something that can establish so readily? And to stay away from it, I've only done the cutting the once, and that was we were still spraying that area, so I was still spraying those stems that were cut, um, as well as the foliage that it cut. So I was just leaving it on site, so I know that it wasn't going to be transported to another site. Um, I would, on the side of caution, like the fact that um, Michigan does not allow you to do any mowing or transport of it. I think um, obviously that shows how much of an issue it is, but obviously I think it's up to a uh, person's preference and what they want to do, but I we tend to stay away from cutting. Yeah, well, it's one of those things that uh, if you want to control it on your own land, um, people have, uh, and, you know, for the majority of people, they have limited options. But if we do cut, I think the best way to do it is to cut one whole plant, dispose of it, cut the next plant, dispose of it. The next plant dispose of it, so you've actually got the entire plant in your hand, or the the stem. Sorry, um, somebody's asking if Japanese knotweed is still available at Ontario nurseries. Any information? Not sure. I know that they did an inventory a few. The OIPC did an inventory a few years ago of nurseries, um, and I'm sure I forget the result if it was, but I I feel like it was like one or two places. Is still sold it, but that was probably four years ago. Um, but don't hold me to that. Is that okay. uh, how she was doing it? It would you'd be hard pressed to find it. And if you find it in the nursery, please let us know um, where so we can make sure that we send some educational material to those nurseries. Uh, how many efforts to date are there to rid areas of knotweed, and how long of a duration are we looking at? This was asked a little bit earlier on in, in the webinar, and I think uh, as far as coordinated efforts, do you have any information for people around your area in the greater GTA, for instance, that might uh, be involved in actively in Japanese knotweed control? I know of ourselves. <laughs> um, we are controlling it actively on uh, quite a few of our properties, as well as on neighboring properties. Um, but in regards to the rest of the GTA, I'm not quite sure of who else is actively controlling it. Um, yeah, don't, don't no problem. No. And this is the hardest part is, is uh, many of us make light work, and I think that's uh, the hardest part is finding other people interested and, and knowing about it. And that's something that the OFPC is constantly um, challenged with. Uh, but for those of you out there working on it, if and you can just send me an email. Uh, we try to keep a good database of people working on 
on uh, all of our invasive plants and uh, keep them uh, in mind for reviewing and contributing to our best management uh, practice guides. Uh, if you need uh, a few contact people, the back of the best management guides, uh, which are available online, uh, you can find the people that reviewed and contributed and contact them or send us an email and we can put you in contact with them. Um, would oil on top of an area, wouldn't it just give uh, further nutrients to the plant that we're controlling? And I think, I don't know if I missaid that, uh, but the idea is to control the plant first um, and go through your control uh, program and then when you're ready to rehabilitate uh, and replant the site at the end, for instance, um, me and some soil will dilute any of the allopathic, uh, sorry, <laughs> that are um, exuded by the Japanese knotweed, which prevents other plants from growing. Uh, that is uh, something that needs to be diluted before you can actually have any kind of seed take hold and be successful. So I'm not sure if I mentioned that before, but uh, rehabilitating the soil, adding nutrients to the soil, fertilizing, for instance, but adding some compost in new soil will just dilute um, the compounds, help establish new plants. It's really quite important to make sure that you have a good growing environment for you, the plants that you want to be growing there. Um, do you have anything to add to rehabilitation or, or uh, um, anything to that effect, Freya? <laughs> Unfortunately, most of our patches are still in control phase because they're, um, I would say, to five years in the making. We have had a couple spots where uh, they were much, much smaller, very, um, like, a couple meters by a couple meters, where we've seemed to have eradicated it almost. There will be a couple of shoots that come up for the last year or so um, that I noticed. But to those ones, we did put down a native seed mix just to help with, because um, it's right beside a river, so the slope stability. Um, we did a native seed mix combined with annual oats um, just to try and get some other vegetation growing. But that we did after three years of tarping and herbicide application. Um, and then when we pulled up the tarps, we did that the following year. So most of our sites were, were finding it's taking a lot longer than we had hoped to control. Um, so it's not, uh, we had tons of experience with the that's restoration. No problem. No, no problem. It's, it's these, that's, that's the kind of the problem with all of these uh, plants that do exude any kind of allelopathic properties or, or chemicals such as the be do with the polyphenol uh, compounds. Um, it's in general, if you want to have any kind of chance at uh, something coming in and growing, you, you just need to rehabilitate the soil. Um, one more question, I think. We, somebody asked what the proper disposal method if you can't burn was, and, and we did cover that. Just to, to um, uh, out of curiosity, Freya, what is your control, uh, what is your disposal method that you guys use? Well, like I said, we tend to leave it on site. Uh, we actually have a burn pit uh, on our one of our areas. So um, going, future, uh, going forward, we're actually going to be burning uh, a lot of our species because uh, we found out that our municipal waste used to uh, heat things up to 70 degrees for four days, but uh, they are no longer doing that. So uh, actually, that was as of this year, we have created a burn pit to, to deal with things like Japanese knotweed and garlic mustard um, because they're getting up to high enough temperatures. Um, but that is always an option. People can check with their local municipality to find out um, what temperatures the um, this area, not your compost, but is uh, being heated up to, and that can be an option. Uh, other than that, it would be what you guys suggested. And, and I think that's like the hardest part, we do have that slide on, on disposal, so please, if you can, uh, reread it. Um, it would be... Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I can jump in. The other thing is we actually looked into trying to help out a landowner with um, removal of the soils. And unfortunately, um, in Ontario, at least in southern Ontario, I'm not sure, we couldn't find anywhere else. But anywhere in the unfortunate <laughs> GTA area, um, because uh, it's not considered a hazardous waste, um, uh, it's 
need a way to, if you were to excavate the soil, um, you have to like trying to find out if we could get it sent somewhere for remediation and all that type of things. But no one seems to do that um, remediation in terms of plants. Uh, matter. It all seems to be more for chemicals and other things. So we were trying to find out for a landowner to see if she was to excavate out an area because it was growing uh, right beside her foundation. Um, where she was funding that soil were, and there didn't seem to be anywhere that we could get it sent to. Um, so it will be up to whoever you have uh, dig it up. But it looked like if it would go to your local dump, it would not be treated at all. So we advise not to bother with that method. Yeah, it depends on where you take it. But uh, we do advise that if you can, if you have any kind of plant material, the, the putting it in a, a sealed uh, black garbage bag and uh, making sure that it bakes in the sun for, for a week, uh, reaching that 50 degree Celsius temperature, um, is pretty much the only surefire way of filling the rhizome. Um, the other option, of course, is fire. Uh, and the other third option, uh, if it's possible, is finding out what temperature your uh, low uh, waste burning facility, if they do have a disposal incineration facility, just making sure that the temperatures are above 50 degrees Celsius are reached. I hope that answers that question. Apriya, do you have a couple minutes to answer a couple more questions? Let's have a discussion. Uh, I'd hate to cut it off early. Um, that's the problem with these webinars. They only have an hour. Did some uh, someone mention that they did some tests with wet blade and herbicide? Uh, they mentioned that Navius worked very well. The test was done around September. Uh, wet blade will mulch the top and not disturb the root. Person mentioned. So that's another option to be looked at. Um, it was just a comment by someone. Let's see what, if there's anything else, um, uh, soil, burning, wet blade, just got a few in my chat box, so I'm just trying to make sure I don't miss anybody. Anyone experimented with plantations of plant species that have stronger allopathic tendencies? Experience, could you comment on that at all for you? No, sorry. Um... I haven't done the, the chemical side of things in terms of analyzing which ones are worse than others. It's more just a so if we notice that one invasive species will outcompete another one, but it tends to be invasive species out competing other invasive species, not a native species like a black walnut or something out know, competing a uh, native invasive species. Yeah, and we've got, uh, it's interesting because things like wild mustard, um, um, sorry, uh, an extreme tendency as uh, uh, being allopathic. Um, trying to find, sorry, I'm trying to uh, switch back and forth between screens here and finding the questions and uh, comments. Um, I'm not sure what this person was asking about experimented. I don't know um, if there, if you could comment on what you mean exactly by experimented with plantations of plant species that have strong uh, tendencies. Um, I can't comment on that unless I, you know what, that person that uh, put that comment out there, if you want to just send us an email with a little bit more of an explication, uh, explanation, we can comment on that outside of the webinar. Um, I'm going to call it there. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions. For those of you who, uh, if I did miss your question uh, and you wanted it answered, please send me an email and I'll be able to send you uh, personally uh, um, an answer back. Uh, within a couple of days. Thank you, Freya, so much for being with us. Uh, I hope uh, uh, you had a little bit of an entertainment uh, um, entertaining for you as, as, as it was for me, and I really appreciate that you took the time to be with us. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful day, and like I said, please, uh, this is our last official webinar, but remember that we do have another one coming up in May. Uh, if for more information, take a look at our website. Have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, by the sunshine.